Michael Dannenberg. I'm the director of the Education Policy Program here at the New America Foundation. Uh, I just want to welcome you to today's event. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with New America, check out newamerica.net. We have three key programs in education, uh, an early education program, PK3, a focus on education budget matters uh, and school reform and K-12, and then our higheredwatch.org blog, uh, all of which are available, at, like I said, at newamerica.net. Uh, I'm going to be playing a very small role in today's event because uh, as a former staffer at Senator Kennedy, uh, who helped draft the No Child Left Behind Act, I have a bias when I raise this with uh, Linda. Her first question to me was, so which parts are you responsible for? <laughs> uh, I told her victory has a uh, thousand fathers and defeats an orphan, as President Kennedy said. Um, anyway, I, I want to introduce Steve Call, our new president and CEO here at New America. Many of you may know him. He is a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, both for his work, his recent fiction work, Ghost Wars, uh, as well as his work previously at the Washington Post for the Securities and Exchange Commission. He's the former managing editor at the Washington Post, and we are thrilled to have him here at New America. Please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Steve Call. Did you say Ghost Wars was fiction? <laughs> okay, okay. No. Uh, my role is going to be even smaller than Michael's, uh, but I just wanted to welcome you on behalf of New America and say a little bit about Michael and Sarah's work since uh, they can't properly toot their own horn. But the education program is really one of the flagship programs that New America has had just an outstanding year. Uh, HigherEdWatch.org <coughs> broke a lot of the news that led to the student loan conflict of interest uh, storyline and, and associated sort of scandals and reforms culminating in a major reform bill um, just a couple of months ago. A really proud achievement for Michael and his staff. I think an indication of the seriousness of their work. Uh, the, in addition to the higher ed section, Sarah and others, good time to check one's uh, ringtone if uh, one hasn't thought of it already. Uh, Sarah's work on early education is also a rising emphasis of ours these days, and I hope uh, there will be some overlap between um, her interest and in research over the last six months and today's discussion. Uh, Linda Perlstein is a former colleague of mine for the Washington Post, and I'm really delighted to have her here. She's a uh, journalist whose ambition for deep, patient, immersion journalism is something that many of her colleagues at the Post uh, respected and admired about her. As a young reporter, she was always looking to uh, go beyond the conventional approaches to stories and to sit still inside interesting environments and record what she saw. That's pr led her to several um, important books, including this one, Tested, which uh, she'll discuss after I turn the microphone over to her in just a second. I'd also like to welcome Tracy Wright, who is um, really one of the significant leaders in early education in Washington, D.C., uh, recently stepped down as principal at, at uh, J.C. Nall, a high-needs school in Washington, where she was just a uh, flagship success in addressing um, the myriad pressures that her school had to cope with in the NCLB era and without reference to NCLB. And Sarah, who I've mentioned, is a senior research fellow in our education program and uh, really one of the leading young leaders here at, at New America. Um, delighted to get to know her over the last couple of months. Our format is that uh, Linda's going to talk for about 10 minutes and then Sarah's going to moderate a discussion. Uh, and then we'll turn to your questions. I think the framework is, I'm sure, apparent to all of you who understand this subject uh, so well. We're going to just try to talk about what the ground reality is in schools that are trying to address the ambitions and also the demands of No Child Left Behind and talk also in the context looking ahead about uh, Reform to the reform, I think, will be part of the discussion. But uh, Linda, you uh, you you guide us through the first uh, phase of this, and we look forward okay. to, to all of it. Thank you. I was going to sit here, but I realize I can't see everyone, <laughs> so I should probably stand up, um, which is better. Sometimes I can't even see over the podium, but this one I can see over. Um, I wanted to thank Steve and Michael and Sarah for bringing me here. Um, I think that any time we can inject some more um, real-world, day-to-day, classroom-level um, insights into the conversation about what's working and what's not working um, for children, um, 
the debate just becomes that much more relevant um, and and we're all better off. Um, because I think that as schools have changed over the last decade, and as you know, if you work in education, this um, many of these changes predated uh, the mm -hmm. law um, when we're talking about test-based um, accountability and standards-based accountability, um, that, that as these changes have occurred over the last 10 or 15 years, um, a lot of people outside of schools um, still have not um, a whole lot of idea what goes on inside them, whether it's, you know, whether it's um, a politician or even even many involved parents um, don't get that kind of um, up close view inside a classroom that really helps you understand what's happening um, day to day. And and at the newspaper, I, I think that my colleagues uh, and I and at uh, around the country did a lot of good work in sort of showing things happening. But by n its nature, it's sort of piecemeal work, and we you know there were there there you might see a piece about. A school schools losing recess because of no child left behind it's a very sort of sexy topic and certainly you see lists of test scores um, or actually I should say pass rates on tests which is not the same as test scores every year and um, and stories about that but to, to get a real true ecology of school and um, people's point of view inside schools and inside school systems and how policies affect day-to-day -day life and how how life outside of school for these people, both the children and the adults, affects what happens inside it, I thought was really um, important to understand people's motivations, to understand um, how well-intentioned policies sometimes have, um, have um, you know, unintended consequences, and not just, um, not just um, the policies, but the decisions being made. Um, whether it's by a school system or by a superintendent or by a state board of education or by a teacher inside her room, which has, you know, it, actually on a practical level um, is nowhere written in the law, but, but our decisions that people are making um, is really important to consider. And so that's what I wanted to do with this book. And I wanted to um, explore what I had seen in my last nine years writing about education as uh, three themes uh, that I think are really um, shaping what school looks like today. And one is simply put the way that um, educators are in many ways not just educating children but sometimes raising them. And um, it's certainly evident when you see, when you go into a school like Tyler Heights, which is the school I wrote about, and a child gets a vision test, and um, as is you know commonplace in schools, they don't pass the uh, vision test, and they, the school arranges for them to get a coupon for free glasses for Sam at Sam's Club, and nobody in their family takes them to Sam's Club to get the glasses, so their teacher takes them to Sam's Club to get the glasses. The guidance counselor at the school I wrote about, um, if you didn't show up for school on time, which was a problem for many of these small children, um, would send you home with an alarm clock and if that didn't work she'd simply come get you breaking all sorts of you know <laughs> policy I'm sure but she needed you in school and um, and I think people would really be stunned to see the amount of adult attention that goes into getting certain children simply through the day um, five adults checking in with one kid every single day to make sure that um, they can get through the day without um, outbursts and hopefully even um, learning along the way. And that happens every day in schools around the country. Uh, the second theme was certainly that we had built a system around, um, around uh, performance on um, standardized tests. And it had become clear to me, while I certainly don't oppose giving children tests, and I certainly think that there is a role for um, state-level standardized tests, or even perhaps national standardized tests, I think it's really important to understand that the tests don't tell you everything you need to know about children. And in many cases, they don't even tell you what um, most of what you need to know about children. And I'll explain very briefly some, some um, of the background behind um, that conclusion, which I think is really important when um, that's being used in some cases as our only measure, whether it's a parent trying to decide a school for her children or um, the government deciding whether a, ch a school is making um, sufficient progress, it's important to understand the limitations of what, what we're seeing. 
And then the third is something that people don't discuss as much, which is the sense of standardization, just for teachers and for children. For teachers, um, it's quite common to be working off um, very structured curriculum, which, by the way, are not always aligned with what's going to be on the test at the end of the year, which is very complicated when it comes to the classroom. Pacing guides that tell you, you know, that ensure that on day 41, a third grade teacher um, at Tyler Heights Elementary School is teaching not just the same thing and often in the same ways as a teacher across the hall, but as a teacher across the county. Um, you know, there was a time uh, at the beginning of the year where um, the, the school system, which used open court reading in all of its schools, um, which is a pretty structured reading program, which tells you what to do every day, um, the county had decided it wasn't quite structured enough, and they wanted to introduce weekly what they called explicit lessons, which gave a teacher a script of everything to say um, in the course of the period. And they put a PowerPoint up on the wall, and there was a drawing of a bank teller. And the presenter from the county told all the principals, a bank teller should be able to walk in off the street and give this lesson. You know, to some people, to some people that kind of, you know, uniformity and ease of use is, is, is perhaps a great thing if you think that, you know, all teachers suck. Um, if you think that, um, you know, if you give some credit toward the professionalization, the professionalism in the profession, um, that's not a great idea. Um, certainly not for everyone. And then for students, I think there's a fundamental paradox of um, today's educational goals. And one is educating children as individuals, which is something we've come to accept, at least people um, in schools, as, as very valuable. But at the same time, um, now um, educators are expected to get everyone to the same place in the same amount of time. And um, that doesn't always, you can't always do both. And so, um, as I wrote in a recent op-ed piece, you ha if you have a child who's reading at the first grade level when they're in fourth grade, because they're mildly retarded, um, it's not just that at the end of the year they're taking this fourth grade test that is over their head and the information you get from that test isn't going to tell you anything you didn't already know. It's that many schools and school systems have decided that every day throughout the course of the year this child needs to be getting fourth grade work. So. If, um, if the lesson of the day is metaphor, her special education teacher will be teaching her metaphor. Um, if it's homonyms, she'll be teaching homonyms, even if the girl is at the point where she can't even sound out words. And so um, those were the themes I wanted to write about. I chose a poor school in an affluent district because I think that's where you see the most academic reforms being made around the country, the kinds of reforms that are um, you know, we're starting to see in all kinds of schools, but certainly where a district has the money and the will and the resources to really make changes and the schools that um, aren't scoring the best as a matter of course and um, getting the most resources, whether from Title I funding or from school systems decisions um, to, to devote the most resources to what they consider their neediest schools. And I wanted to pick a school that um, was an example of um, from the outside of things done right. So I picked a school with a dynamic principal with increasing test scores. Um, they, had, they had instituted what they called a laser sharp focus. The principal called a laser sharp focus on improvement, although in, in her case it was mostly a laser sharp focus on this Maryland school assessment. Um, and, you know, when I chose the school, I, you know, I was writing, the school I wrote about is sort of, I like to explain it as it's an example, it's not a sample set. Um, I've been in enough schools over the last nine years that I knew what I was seeing. Um, I knew when I was seeing things that were happening, you know, at the hundreds of other schools I've been to and among the hundreds of other educators I speak with um, around the country. Um, so I was aiming to write about what for many people is a fairly common experience in schools today. Um, I think the school had done a good job in the last um, few years really getting um, behavior problems under control, although it concerned me that the way they did that was to um, commodify everything in, in tangible rewards, whether it was showing up at school or reading a book or, um, you know, get, giving a good question, answer to a question or proofreading your text your test, um, you could get a potato chips um, for, or a popsicle for just about everything you did in the building. But um, 
they were trying to build this culture of learning, and I think they had slightly improved in that regard from at least the stories that I had heard from the way things were and the number of police visits to the building. Um, I think the students got very good to some degree at answering the kind of questions that were on the Maryland school assessment. Um, but there was certainly a cost. Um, people talk about narrowing the curriculum, and I'm here to tell you it's very, very, very real. Um, and if, our, if you narrow the curriculum to just what was on um, the state test at the end of the year, if you really thought the state test tested everything um, your third graders needed to know, I think that would be fine. But I think we're deluded if we think that it does. And it's not just that these tests, you know, that, that Maryland wasn't testing their kids at this point in social studies and science. You know, Maryland's um, reading test, and this is not uncommon, certainly didn't test writing. Um, uh, it purports to test uh, critical thinking, but um, I think that's um, I think that's debatable. It doesn't t test, for example, grammar, which is certainly a skill in the third grade um, third grade state standards, and um, and something we want our children to learn. So that, I'm just using reading as an example to show that it's not testing everything you want children to know. So. Um, if you narrow your instruction to that, as they did at this school and, and many others, um, you're doing kids a disservice. And it's not just sort of what they're learning, but how. Um, there's, for example, a, um, and I'm realizing I'm taking up too much of my time and I have so much more to say, but I'm going to just hope that it comes up and the other things come up in the questions. They, um, they, we're expected a question on there, and it's not just the state test at the end of the year. There's benchmarks tests throughout the year and open court tests and tests that they've designed, by the way, every test to mimic what will look like the MSA. Um, how do you know this is a poem? And, you know, they had to write a brief paragraph. I know this is a poem because it has stanzas, rhyme, and rhythm. It has stanzas because it has two paragraphs that don't indent. It has rhyme because C and she rhyme, so on. The teachers in this school, their children were having problems writing um, that paragraph, um, so they had their children write it over and over and over again. The children I focused on wrote that poem, that paragraph, dozens of times. Yet they only wrote three poems um, the whole year and after the MSA. And one of them was a haiku, and two of them were acrostics, which, you know, S-P-R-I-N-G, and then you have a word for each letter, which, by the way, doesn't have rhyme, stanzas, or rhythm. And I think that we can all agree that in the end, the better way to learn, you know, to understand the structure and form of poetry is to read poems, to write poems, to define what a stanza is, but then, you know, to say, well, I'm writing a poem with two stanzas, and it has two stanzas because so-and-so and such-and-such. There's nothing in No Child Left Behind that tells a teacher that um, they can't let their children write poems. And I think in the end, I think people in the schools need to take responsibility for the fact that it may take them a little longer to learn poetry that way. And it may not always result in the best crafted um, paragraph in the short term about the structure of a poem. But I think that um, in the end, um, in the end, you have a child who is much more likely to understand that goal, which that standard, which is um, understanding the form um, of a poetry of a poem. Um, one more thing is just that I think that the law, in its intentions, was that we would sort of um, we would no longer have two classes of schools. You know, one where kids write get to write poems, and one where kids don't get to write poems, and so on. And um, the problem is when you're just measuring um, schools by the um, percentage of children passing a test, it's easy to think that maybe you've achieved that. If the kids at Tyler Heights, 90% of them pass the MSA, and at um, this other school I visited down the road, 90% also pass the MSA uh, school, um, you know, an affluent school where kids come with a lot more skills and they sort of get through the scripted curriculum quicker, they get to do all these other things in the course of the day, Looking at the percentage of kids passing and seeing that it's similar, unfortunately, does not tell you that those kids are getting a similar education. And I think that that's really important for us to understand because by, being, by getting to know those children well, by seeing what they learned and what they didn't through the course of the year, I could tell you that that 90% at the end of the year didn't mean a whole lot for these kids. If any of you met them, you would not be impressed by um, 
what they were able to do and not do. And it's sad for me to say that because I cared about them deeply, but I came away with great concerns about their future and their abilities, and those concerns were not reflected um, in the numbers that you read um, in the paper about um, that school. And um, I'll stop at that, and I'm sure much more will come up later. Um, thank you, Linda. Um, I guess, Tracy, I just wanted to turn to you. What you read tested, and I'm just curious, J.C. Nall is a different school than Tyler Heights. It's in D.C. It faces similar but also different challenges. What in the book resonated with you, and what did you feel was really foreign from your experience? If you hear a quiver in my voice, it's not because I'm nervous. I am just freezing um, cold. <laughs> it is so cold up here, and the air is like blasting me in my face. So if you hear a, a slight quiver, that's what it's all about. Um, what was the same or what resonated. Uh, Linda's book opens up with the principal kind of being very nervous waiting for those test scores and if you read the book what's communicated is that there is a longing, a wanting, a nervousness, a, oh my gosh what are these test scores going to say and that small portion of the book it just rang true in my spirit because every single summer um, I was Tina McKnight waiting for those test scores, waiting to hear the, uh, get the email to find out what did the children at JC and all do. Unfortunately, our work and our effort as administrators, educational administrators, teachers, it's come to be validated by our test scores, which um, I can say in our case did not reflect the level of work and effort we put into our children. So that was one of the things that really resonated um, with me. Some of the other things, um, the wanting, um, the personal neglect that you see of, of the educational administrator and often of educators. We put our lives on hold, um, oftentimes to educate other children, which is a choice um, because we love it. Um, I always tell this story, this, since stepping down as principal from NAL, this was my first year where I actually got to do school shopping for my children. Went and got my 12-year-old daughter size four and a half shoes, got home, she said, Mama, wear a size six and a half now. Um, so these don't fit. So I'm saying, where have I been um, for the last couple of years? Um, some of the differences between my experience and I think um, Tina McKnight's experience as a principal of Tyler Heights Elementary School. Um, J.C. Nall, uh, Tyler Heights, from what I read, was, was a high need school. J.C. Nall was an extremely um, high need school. And unlike Tyler Heights, which was a poor school in an affluent district, Nall was a poor school in a poor district. So a lot of the resources that they had at Tyler Heights, we did not have at J.C. Nall. Um, also, it's located in um, a quadrant in the city that is a war zone for lack of a better uh, way to describe it. In my four years, we had two dead bodies, one on my playground, one on the street, and my babies walked over the body to get to school. And so I hear people saying, oh my God, that's the reality of what our children see every day. And so kind of trying to push past what that does to a person, what that, does, what that did to the children, what that did to the adults, to get back to the business of getting ready for the test uh, was very difficult for us. Uh, something else that was different, because my children were experiencing that on a regular basis, it may not have always happened at the school, but oftentimes, read the newspaper, it happened in their apartment building, it happened on the corner before they got to the building. So while I had a laser-like focus on student achievement, I'm a social worker, and it would have been inhumane for me to not pay attention to what they were going through emotionally, um, to what they were going through socially. And so while I did choose to focus on student achievement, I also chose to focus on building healthy children. And um, we were really blessed to have a really significant grant from the Freddie Mac Foundation that supported our school. And so we were able to have nine mental health workers uh, to work with our children, and they had very heavy caseloads. Um, the last thing is, is that if you look at the test data from JC and all, it's very different from Tyler Heights. We'd not hit that 90% proficiency mark. However, when I got to know only 30 to 34% of our children were able to read at the basic level. When I left, 88% were able to read at the basic level. But in spite of that growth, if you looked at our NCLB report card, we were still deemed a school that needed improvement in reading because basic is not enough. Even though 70% 
were below basic, the fact that we cleared out almost that whole subgroup and pushed them so that they were ready to make that next step. We always talk about moving from good to great. Well, there's a pre-move from ghastly to good. <laughs> and, and we moved from ghastly to good. But those types of things, um, the media doesn't want to talk about those things because they're not sexy. So I think those were some of the similarities and differences. Thanks, Thanks Tracy. Um, one of the things that was interesting to me reading the book, Linda, was um, you go through the book and you see all the ways teachers are emphasizing test prep and you see all the things, kids writing the 12 VCRs about how I know this is a poem. And then you get to chapter 18 and Tina McKnight is looking at what the kids have to do to pass the test and some of the, the confidence intervals and other things in the Maryland state system. And it almost sounds like maybe the test isn't really as hard as it sounded like it is the whole time. Um, does a school like Tyler Heights really need to put that level of intense focus on testing and on test prep only to pass the test? Or, um, or is that partly an issue of decisions that are made in a climate of fear rather than, rather than knowledge? Some of the things you were talking about. Yeah, I mean, she knew exactly, you know, with the confidence intervals, she knew exactly how many kids in each subgroup and so on. She, and she could probably name you the kids, you know, that needed to pass. And, and it wasn't that much. She didn't tell her teachers that. But it really wasn't, didn't take that much to make adequate yearly progress. Um, her goals, you know, her personal goals for the school and the school's school improvement goals were higher than what it takes to make AYP. Um, and the thing is, you can't really say, um, is it easy to pass the test just be based on um, the percentage of kids that need to pass. You also have to look at the test, which by the way, I mean, the secrecy of tests and the information that people get from them is, is such a joke in a system where what's on the test is so vastly important. But to really understand whether or not it's hard, you have to see the test. You have to see, understand how much the kids have to do and not do to pass. And then you look at the percentage of, you know, the confidence intervals and so on. But the short answer is no. I don't think it's, it's, it's that hard to overall, you know, make AYP um, at that particular school from where they were. I mean, I think she knew they were going to make AYP. Of course, her goal, I mean, she had to meet or exceed last year's. And after, by the way, in the year after the book, um, third grade math score, math percentage, passing rate went down hugely, which was interesting because through the whole course of the year, they were taking these county benchmarks, which were supposed to be facsimiles of the MSA. And they had, the kids had done just fine on those. There was no indication that those kids were any worse at math than the kids the year before. Their benchmark scores were just fine. Their unit test scores were just fine. And then only 53% of the third graders passed the MSA in math. And the teachers to this day have no idea why. They have no idea why. They haven't seen, you know, they don't get to see the test after it's taken and graded. They, um, it's just contradictory data. They have no, you know, they have no, um, they don't have the capacity to analyze. But the question, you know, the bigger question about whether or not, um, you know, you have to do things this way and you have to give kids, you know, 20 practice tests a week or whatever. Um, no, of course you don't. Um, you know, like, like that example with the poem, I think that if your primary goal is to get kids to um, write a BCR that you think will, um, BCR, brief constructed response, that will score a three on the MSA, three being the highest score. Um, I can understand why the teachers made that choice. I do think that that, you know, making them write the paragraph over and over again in the short term might make them write the paragraph better. But yeah, I mean, I think that in the end, um, not just the teachers in the classroom, but the principals and the principal supervisors and all the people above them that are making decisions and judgments, you know, that they bear um, a great responsibility for, in the end, um, teaching children in the way they feel is most valuable. Tracy, I saw you nod your head a couple times when Linda was talking. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Well, a couple of things. One in particular, um, I was laughing at the fact that the children had to write the poem in, to get ready for the BCR mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of times, and they may have, you know, knocked that item out the box on that test, but were those skills transferable? 
And that's one of the issues around NCLB. You do get into this whole mode of being afraid, afraid of not making AYP. And, and we are kind of indoctrinating kids to pass the test. But are those skills transferable? I would say that they're not, which is why you see as they progress and they get into middle school and high school, the scores go lower and lower and lower. Yeah, they're very narrow. I mean, they're v learning to write that particular paragraph is not really the skill in the end you want the kids mm -hmm. to have. You want these skills that can be sort of built on from year to year that can really help them be good students, not just um, in that one room on that one day, but throughout the course of their education. I don't think it I, I'm not here to say it can't be done. I'm just saying that um, that the system of accountability isn't necessarily making it be done. One of the things that was interesting to me when you were talking just now is you talked about how you know Tina knew exactly what students and you know the use of data comes up a lot in your book. And I know when I looked at your resume and some of what the work that you do with the principals that you mentor now, a lot of it does involve looking at data. And I think that's one of the things that people who aren't in schools find rather foreign in this conversation or don't understand. Can you talk a little bit about what is this data that you're working with, where does it come from, and what, what pieces of it are most useful um, in, in that climate for you as an educator? Oh, data. Who created that word? Um, please let me know where they are so I can do something to them. Um, <laughs> this whole piece about data, as I, as I started out, I said we have um, come to be validated by what our data says. So if you're going to validate my work based on my data, well, I'm going to have two sets of data. And this is just me speaking as an administrator. I'm going to have the set of AYP and CLB data, which oftentimes is meaningless because what if your curriculum is not aligned to your standards? And what if the standards are not aligned to that assessment? Then, in essence, we're teaching our children on something that they really may not have seen for the entire year. This is reality um, for many school systems. There's this whole piece about misalignment. So if you use that data as the data to drive your instructional program, um, you're going to become very frustrated because what you're going to find is you don't have the resources and the tools in the in the system um, package curriculum to address those different skills and standards. And so you have that one set of data. Um, as an administrator, it was very important for me to have data on what we actually were teaching our children. Are they progressing? And our data um, was always higher. Our children were growing. They were learning. Um, and we saw the evidence of it. And so we use that set of data to really um, inform our decisions around our instructional programs and our services. Um, and that's, that's kind of how we use it. And that's how I encourage the principals who I continue to work with and mentor. Uh, and there are six of them. That's, we, we, we still have those two sets of data, data that we work from. I want to add to that just to say that on the question of what data is useful and what data isn't, it's, it's incredibly complex. And I think that some teachers and some educators, you know, I think that, that um, some find data useful that others don't. Some data they find useful and some data they don't. Um, but usually, almost always, it sort of just tells them what they already knew. And then sometimes, in some cases, it tells them what they know not to be true in the case of, you know, the best student in the class I was writing about could never ever finish her BCRs and, and, and she was absolutely, um, absolutely the smartest girl and the most, um, with the most abilities and, and in any other circumstance ability to show them in the class and then by the numbers she really should have had remediation. Um, by the numbers on the benchmark test, and the teachers were like, this is crazy, I'm not giving her remediation because in this one circumstance, she mm -hmm. just freaks out or something, and, and any other time she can do this work. Um, Dibbles, which is the dynamic indicator of basic early literacy skills, is a test, it's not a state, you know, it's not a state standardized test, it's a test that's used a lot in um, the early grades, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, to assess um, students and to often assess whether um, it's really a lot of schools are using it for their reading first grants to show um, what works and what doesn't work and so on um, and they give it to the kids one-on-one -on -one. Um, it's a timed test of um, various things and I'll just give you one brief example um, I watched about 30 30 kids go through Dibble's assessments and one of the things that um, that um, was very 
odd about the test, among some other things, was, you know, if you've, you're, you're, you're shown pictures and, and you're asked which one goes with the bus sound and the cuss sound and the is sound, okay? If you say the bus sound goes with the bear, you're wrong because that's k for cub. And if you say k goes with the car, that's wrong because that's really b for bump. And if you say the b goes with the bug, really it's i for insect. Okay, this is just one small example. And, but you can look at the broader picture and say, okay, when I sit down with that one five-year-old to take that test, is that really a precise measurement of, of, of his knowledge, of his literacy knowledge and abilities? Forget the fact that there's all these pictures of things that some of these kids have never seen in their life. But, like, um, I think it can be, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, I don't think it's necessarily, you know, evil to give a kid dibbles. It's just not a great idea to, to assume that it tells you, you know, it's an exact, you know, it's a precise measurement of that kid's early literacy skills when, when like any test, it's, it's, it's flawed. You guys are pretty hard on, on NCLB and on accountability. Wait, so I didn't say I was hard on NCLB. Right, I said yeah. I was hard about a lot of I'm things that are going on. Some of the things are going So I guess, I mean, my question to you is um, sort of Congress is up to reauthorize the law right now, and um, there's a lot of debate going on about what should be changed, what, you know, should be improved, what should be kept the same. I guess I'm curious if you were, you know, responsible to advise a member of Congress right now on NCLB reauthorization, what would you, what would you tell them? Um, what kind of policy advice would you give for, for people in this room that, that deal with policy? Do you want to try that first, Tracy, or do you want me to go? Uh, my, my big ticket um, item and or issue is school choice. Um, and, I, and I'll leave the assessment and that accountability piece um, to Linda, because we talked about it, and she is so eloquent about it, and I agree with everything she says. Uh, <laughs> So I'm just going to talk her briefly everywhere. <laughs> um, about the school choice piece, which uh, we don't shine a whole lot of light on it. Just let me give you a little bit of information about what happened at, at my school. My first year there, we made about 20 to 25 percent gains in student achievement in both reading and math um, at our school. And this is after one year, which was pretty darn good growth. Okay, so what happens then? We're on a roll. We have this momentum. Boom, school choice happens. And all is located in, the, in, again, in the southeast quadrant of the city. And there were several, about four lower performing schools around Nall. Well, NCLB says, well, parents, you know, the school isn't doing really well, but hey, that school right there is doing better than your school, so how about you transfer your child over there if you'd like to? And so that first year after being at Nall, under this whole school choice piece with NCLB, we received the most children citywide under that transfer piece, okay? So where does that put us as a school? We were making these gains, we were pushing forward, and then we get this huge influx of children whose skill level um, was subpar. So now, um, as we go into the next year, we're working even harder, because now we're trying to pull our new students up to where our students who were with us last year are, plus still push the children we have forward, okay? That year, we made more gains in reading, slid a little bit in math, send your children to Nall again. So every year, under this school choice piece, children transferred into our school up until that third year when they actually did the consolidation of schools in Washington, D.C. One of the lowest performing schools in the city closed down, and that entire elementary school program was melted into ours. And so we were right back at square one. So if I were um, going to give some advice, that whole school choice piece needs to be reevaluated um, because just because student achievement is not really great as a school, it doesn't mean that the school itself is necessarily troubled. There may be some things that are going on with the instructional program that you can tweak and squeak, but the answer is not always let's get them out of here and send them someplace else. That doesn't always work. So I assume that you don't mind getting the kids, you just mind people looking at your pass rates and assuming that the instruction has deteriorated That's because exact. your pass rates went down. That's something. right. I never minded getting the children. We, we absolutely loved um, the consolidation that we went through. Loved it. We got about 100 new children. We loved that. What we didn't like was the fact that nobody cared that we had a consolidated school. No one stopped and said, hey, maybe we should reconfigure the data for this school. Um, it was treated as if nothing happened. And so the next year, 
when we didn't make our targets, it was like, ooh, Nall didn't make their targets. Not, ooh, Nall melted about 100 kids into their program and managed to push all those kids who were below basic into that next performance category. Great job, Nall. So that's the part that I would change. I'll start by saying I don't think there is a law that can really um, effectively on a day-to-day -day level change and improve what goes on in classrooms. Um, I will be so bold as to say that. So to me, it almost doesn't matter, um, you know, it doesn't matter to me um, to some degree what happens with No Child Left Behind because in the end, um, I think that the real important decisions are being made in schools and in school systems and even in states, but um, further down the line. And it's more in the approach people are taking and how much f they let their fear, um, you know, take over. Um, however, there are specific, you know, there, there are specific things I care about. First of all, like I mentioned, I think um, test secrecy um, the, it makes very little sense. Um, the same items are used year to year in most states, and that's because it's too expensive to write new ones, and I understand that. But teachers see the test when they give it, and then they, you know, they sign things saying they're not going to use that information for whatever purposes. But they see the tests, and the children certainly see the tests, and they're no, under no obligation not to talk about it. So who are you protecting by keeping everything so secret and by then continuing to not give educators the real information they need to understand? You know, in, in Maryland, they get data broken down by comprehension of informational text, comprehension of literary text, and general reading processes. They don't know if their kids had trouble teasing out main ideas, if it was in the way they wrote their BCRs, if it was, you know, that they had, um, they couldn't, you know, decipher multiple meaning words. The real things that are the meat of instruction, they don't get that kind of information back, and that's because um, the state says if we broke it down, broke the data down that far, um, then it would be no longer statistically significant. Um, so I think, um, you know, that they see the tests every year um, helps explain why the pass rates go up um, every year and that they don't the same way on NAEP. I mean, it's no, it's obvious um, to me. Um, I think that absolutely um, a growth model is um, an improvement over judging kids against a group of kids, you know, judging fourth graders against a group of fourth graders last year. However, a growth model, um, the way it's being discussed now in most cases would not, um, you know, if you, if you have children who, you know, if you have that that mentally retarded girl I talk about taking the fourth grade test, even if she were to, um, even if she were to go from the first grade reading level to the third grade reading level in one year, that would not be captured. Um, that would not be captured if she's taking fourth grade test. Frankly, I don't know. Um, I I don't even ascribe to the notion of you know this mythical like one year's progress for every child because I do think that children are very individual and um, you're not really allowed to say that in this climate. But um, but I think you know some children should be expected to make what we would consider two years progress in one year and some some less. Um, I think that um, while in theory I definitely agree with um, with a, with the idea of not paying teachers simply based on how long they have been in the building or in, in the profession. Um, I certainly don't know how, um, you know, I don't pretend to know know how a, um, uh, what I think would be best, which would be a merit pay system that um, contains both qualitative and quantitative elements. However, I don't think that, that basing it primarily on um, the test scores of their children is a good idea. Um, simply because logistically it doesn't um, make sense in a case like Tyler Heights where you have kids being pulled out for intervention several times a day by different reading specialists. They get after school tutoring by a different um, teacher. Um, and then there's the fact that the teacher, classroom teacher herself has very little role in that building deciding what and how she teaches um, every day. Um, the whole other point that, you know, if the dad takes his kid off ADHD meds, for the four weeks before the test or pulls them out, they're absent for four weeks before the test, which I've seen that happen too. Um, I just think that there are so many sort of practical reasons why um, that concept is far more complex than it seems like on paper. 
And I think that the best, um, I think some of the most important things we can do for children's educational achievement are, um, are, are outside the purview of this particular law. I mean, there's an everything gap in our country, we talk about an education gap, and in a community like the one I wrote about, there's there's um, an income gap, there's a safety gap, there's a health gap, and you know I think that I think that getting children health insurance is as important as um, what kinds of accountability um, you hold their teachers to when it comes to, when you're talking about how they're going to do in school every day. And this is a kind of thing that people who work inside schools understand as a matter of course, that it matters when children um, are safe, when their parents can read, when their parents um, have time to, to take care of them and parents making good choices about um, their children and when they're healthy. And so I, I just think it's such a sort of broader um, you know, broader thing. And this is not something that can be um, addressed in the law. I mean, but I think that there's such a climate of um, sort of fear among educators. You know, it's like principals don't really want to hear what teachers have to say. Um, school system people don't want to hear what um, principals have to say. Superintendents don't want to hear what their staff has to say, really, honestly. Um, State boards of ed don't want to hear what school systems have to say. And then it seems like the Department of Education doesn't always want to hear what um, anyone has to say. And I think that until we really sort of have a true climate of openness, um, um, some of these conversations aren't going to happen. Well, those are some pretty provocative points. Let's turn it over to the audience. To um, We have some people here who know a lot about these things and have a lot of insights on them as well um, to, to ask some questions. Um, I'm actually going to stand up as Linda did so I can see people who are asking questions. Um, does anybody have a question? Um, sir. Yeah, I mean that's a good question, and I and I, I have a few answers to that. I'm not just talking about poetry and art. I'm talking about where to put a comma. You know, I'm talking about computational math skills um, in states where you're allowed to use a calculator on the math test. I mean, there's a lot of even basic skills that are being narrowed out of existence in schools where the focus is purely what's going to be on the test. So we'll start with that, and in that case, I think we can all agree we want our children to be learning several skills that are basic, fundamental, important skills that aren't necessarily on the state assessment. Going past that, um, I do think that the children that I, first of all, not every child at that school came, you know, not every child in that third grade class um, had horrible skills. You know, so to sort of condemn them all to say, we're not going to do social studies, you know, barely at all, and we're not going to do science, and you're not going to get to do any projects, and you're not going to get to do any writing um, besides BCRs all year, um, maybe for sort of the most in need children, um, although I'd argue that that doesn't even make sense for them for reasons that, you know, sometimes it's through these other things that you learn that reading has a purpose, that you learn that, um, you know, your basic math skills are important. But but to sort of condemn an entire school community to that kind of education, um, where there were plenty of kids in that building who, who really needed that and were really checking out because they weren't getting it, and they would look at the science kits in the back of the classroom that the county provided and say, you know, sort of longingly and say, when are we going to get to do that? You know, that's just not that's just not right. And those kids are gonna have to go to middle school and they're gonna have to take science in middle school and they're gonna have to take science in high school. We've no we have not yet decided that we don't care that people can do science. And there are basic, you know, there are basic um, skills in science like understanding the scientific method and understanding measurement that are important too. And so why doom them to be, be being behind in that too? I frankly don't think it's an either or and I shouldn't be set up as one. Um, you know, if you have to add two hours to every school day, I'm fine with that, um, and two months, you know, but I think that we can't set it up as, um, you know, as an either or. Okay, 
Can I, can I add something to that? It's so interesting because we're moving as a society towards being this global community. I mean, globalization is, is a really huge issue, but the way that we're preparing our students is putting them in a very small, tiny box um, and not pushing them to think outside of that box and not giving them the, cool, the tools that they're going to need in order to, to be able to survive in a global society. The part about not teaching social studies and science, that is the truth. Um, social studies and science gets pushed to the side because right now it doesn't count towards adequate yearly progress, so we don't teach it because it's all about AYP, so it's reading and math. My children got three hours of reading instruction every single day. Three hours. What could you do for three hours every day and not get sick of it? But we need it to make those scores because our work was not real unless we made AYP. So we are not doing our children um, a good service by narrowing um, what we teach them in school. Ma'am? Um, reading. I, I guess I have two, two. One question for you and one question for you. You can read three hours every day, but you can be reading social studies. You can be reading all kinds of stories mm -hmm. and history. Mm -hmm. You can be reading stories about science. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it depends upon what you're reading, and that allows you to acquire those kinds of skills. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, it depends upon what you restrict the reading to be. Mm -hmm. If it is enhanced, you are teaching content. That would be. You want to teach that's that's the how, so you can ex expand it. And I'd like you to comment on that. The other thing I'm going to ask my other question. Apparently, that science will be tested now, once in the in the elementary schools, three to six. Once in the middle schools, or I don't know something like that. It's six to eight. And then once in, in the high schools. So you're going to have if what is tested is going to be taught, you're going to get science taught at all three levels. So. You go first. Uh huh. I agree. Um, you can teach reading across the content areas, but that is something that takes great skill, um, knowledge, and know how on the part of teachers. And unfortunately, where my school was, there were not very many teachers who had a lot of um, experience in being able to do that. I had a lot of very new teachers um, who had not grown to have that skill level as of yet. The other piece is, is that um, in our system, we underwent rapid alignment. And what that means is that for some time we were out of, we didn't have the standards um, as NCLB requires, and we didn't have the assessment that was all on. So we were out of alignment. So we underwent rapid alignment in a process that usually takes most school systems between two and four years to do. We did it in six months. And so the priority as a system was reading and math curriculum. So that was what we had. Our social studies <coughs> curriculum was very dated. Um, it's brand new now, so the, the school system did purchase a brand new curriculum, so hopefully we'll see that. But at the time, the tools that we had were the reading tools, and then we purchased um, a remediation intervention program because we had so many new students that we had to work with. So I agree, but there were a couple of bumps um, to that, and that was the skill of the teachers and then also having the materials to do that with. I would take what you said further and to say, yes, you know, there, there's a lot you can read about social studies and science, but reading alone doesn't constitute learning social studies and science. So, you know, what often happens when people are trying to make that compromise and give reading in the content area, you know, like they did at the school I was at, and the principal said, well, give them some readings in social studies and science. You're trying to find a reading that fits the skill that you're trying to teach you know, whether it's main idea or author's point of view or something. So you're, you're choosing it because of that and not because that's the part of the science curriculum or the social studies curriculum that you need to be teaching, first of all, and that happens really commonly. So the kids that I was dealing with were getting sort of random social studies and science passages, which were really serving, you know, a reading purpose, but didn't help them in their, you know, Amelia Earhart, um, some random thing about um, these two women explorers and, you know, just things that didn't necessarily cohesively give them science and social studies knowledge. So, I mean, I think that, I think that, you know, there's a lot in social studies and science when it's taught, right, that is reading and math. So instead of saying we're just going to throw a few readings into, um, 
into uh, a related readings into our reading curriculum, why not say we're going to continue to do a thorough social studies and science curriculum knowing that that's going to help um, reading and math and be good um, on its own. Um, about science being tested, um, yes, it's going to be tested in a few grades. Um, you know, I reserve judgment until I see how, how that impacts things. It won't, be, it won't count for adequate yearly progress um, 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 calculations, so I don't know if that affects how intensely it's going to be paid attention to. Um, because it's only going to be in a few grades, I don't know if that means they're going to get a dose of exactly what to expect on the fifth grade science test in fifth grade and still no, you know, still no um, science in third grade. I don't know how it's going to turn out, so I'm interested to see, too. Tracy, I wanted to just grab on something you said about, about the teachers and sort of the difficulty in getting experienced, high-quality teachers in a school that faces the challenges of J.C. Nall or a Tyler Heights. The, the age of the teachers was the striking thing to me in, in Tested, that um, a lot of them were very young. Um, two questions, I guess. One is, you know, what what could be done to improve the ability of schools like J.C. Nall and Tyler Heights to attract and retain high quality and experienced teachers? And then sort of a counterpoint to that, my impression is that a lot of the sort of the bank teller stuff that you talked about um, from the PowerPoint with the bank teller is really a response to this concern that we have a lot of young and inexperienced teachers. And how how are schools going to negotiate that those two tensions between trying to do the best you can with the pool that you have, but also trying to attract high quality mm -hmm. teachers that may need a different set of, you know, encouragements and supports than mm -hmm. inexperienced new teachers. Yeah, the answer to this question makes me sad. Um, and it makes me sad because you have, there is no amount of money that I believe that you could pay someone to come to work in these types of schools. You have to do it because you want to do it. Um, because it's your calling, because it's in your spirit, because you don't just want to teach, but you want to teach in this kind of community with these children that may have these issues. There's not, money is not a lure. Um, a free degree can't be a lure because after you do it for some amount of time, the stress level is going to make you say, you know what, I don't care about that degree anymore. I'll take out a loan. Um, so you have to kind of want to do it. Um, I have often thought going into the helping professions and trying to tap some of those people to become educators like social workers, um, mm -hmm. psychologists, um, people who already have um, a desire to, to help um, children, to help to see them do well, going into those fields and preparing them to become educators. Because quite honestly, um, I would my opening speech every year w to my teachers was, was, if you came here just to teach, then you need to go home because I expect you to be a social worker. Um, you have to be a mom. You will be a dad. You will be a counselor. And if you can't wear all those hats, then this is not the place for you. Let me help you transfer out so that you can be happy and so that I can be happy. So I don't think that there's a cut and dry answer to that. I don't think there's um, an incentive that could be offered because it really is a calling. It's not um, a job. I think that this is a this is a huge problem, and um, you know, of the three teachers in the third grade that I wrote about, one left to go to Virginia. Um, she went to Virginia for personal reasons, but she really couldn't stand being at the school anymore. And she's now teaching um, affluent kids in a non-testing year, a non-state testing year, and she's simply put happier with her job and. And she really wanted to be that teacher who made a difference for poor kids. And and one of the teachers would like to leave, um, would like to leave. And one of the um, one of the other teachers um, from the third grade that I wrote about did move within the school to a non MSA year um, because of the pressures. Um, I I don't think that just because you're young and fresh out of school, you're necessarily um, um, you're necessarily less capable. In fact, I think a lot of the teachers that I know are coming out of school with some great ideas about how to teach, and um, they, then they come to a school where it's so sort of so rigid and so the pressures, you know, are so specific, and that they don't get to use some of the techniques that they know would be best for their children. And I think that's as frustrating as anything else. Um, 
teaching kids who, I mean, already at age eight, a lot of these kids didn't seem to care anymore. And that was really hard to, to see, and I've seen that um, in other schools too. But this is, you know, it's, it's hard to, to have um, eight-year-olds in your face telling you um, not, you know, you can't tell me what to do. And um, one of the kids said, you, you've got X's in your eyes, meaning you're, you're a dead woman, um, being called um, a nigger by a little kid in your class. I mean, things like this happening on a daily basis are hard. The people in this building, that's, I don't think that's their main problem. I think that, I think that they feel um, precluded for several reasons from teaching the ways they know is best. And I think you know, the, the, the fifteen hundred dollars a year they get for making AYP and the fifteen hundred dollars they get for teaching in a high need school, you know, isn't what keeps them there or makes them leave. And by the way, a lot of them do leave. There's a huge turnover at the school and um, and that's a problem and it's not uncommon. But but in the end, even though I think you can be young and a good teacher and an experience and a good teacher, the experience inequity um, is huge, and there are provisions written into No Child Left Behind to deal with this that are completely ignored, you know, or loopholed out of the way. Mm -hmm. And school systems um, aren't doing anything to fix it, and the unions aren't doing anything to fix it, and no one's, no one's really demanding that this, that this be improved. And, and, um, and I don't know how it can change. I really don't, but I wish it would. And, and, and you know, it's, it's just... It's just not fair that like the most experienced classroom teacher at that school had like five or seven years of experience, and you know you could get a school down the road where where half the teachers have been you know in the same school for twenty years. Now that doesn't necessarily mean they're great. We all know of teachers who have been to around twenty years who you wish would just get the hell out of there, mm -hmm. but but there needs to be more of a balance. Absolutely. Um, ma'am. Yes, I'd be curious to know what. Huh. would be to address what's happening in the schools and what you see. At, at the federal level, we, we go to briefings all the time, we get different proposals, they run the gamut. But from where you sit, what would be the top three strategies mm -hmm. for improvement? Mm -hmm. oh, well, you go. Start. Okay, well, my, my, unfortunately, they're not simple and they'll never happen. But I'll tell you, uh, three things I'd like to see. I'd completely blow up teacher preparation programs and I would have teachers get educated in a liberal, with an undergraduate liberal arts degree or a, you know, sciences degree. They would go to the equivalent of a law school, that rigorous, that intense to prepare them for teaching. They come out of school and they immediately make the same kind of money as lawyers. I mean, it would raise the professionalism of the profession so much. Um, it's never going to happen, and I don't know that we can even afford for it to happen. But, um, but I think that um, it would change the culture a lot. Number two, I would totally blow up the system of, of um, you know, <laughs> you're in third grade because you're eight, and this is what you're going to learn on day 41. You know, I mean, I would, I would. It's not even a system that I can even fathom in my head, but I, I see, um, you know, I see people moving along. Um, um, at the rates that they need to, and for some kids that's going to be a lot faster, you know. I mean, I'm very into sort of individualized learning. And number, th number three, I would have true anti-poverty programs in this country. And, and I would, I would um, you know, we live in a time when for the last two decades at least, almost none of our presidential candidates mention poverty at all. Um, you know, they'll talk about the middle class, like very occasionally the working class and almost never the poor. The problems in school are the problems, you know, the problems in schools like Tyler Heights or like in Nall are, are problems of, 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 of poverty and, and um, you simply can't fix one without the other, in my opinion. I agree. Um, I definitely agree with those three. In fact, I was scribbling down my three, and, and my second one was about understanding poverty, um, which is huge. Um, we need to address the fact that, that children who are raised in poverty um, learn differently. Um, now, let me, let me say this. I am not saying that they are not as brilliant as children who are not in poverty, because they are. They are extremely resourceful. Um, they are smart, but they do things differently. 
mm-hmm. um, as do children who are born into wealth. Uh, they do things differently, and we need to recognize that. Um, so that would be one of the other pieces that we need to understand that we are in many schools in many cities educating children of war. What do I mean by that? A lot of times we turn on the TV and we see children in these other countries um, who have seen just absolutely heinous things, and we say, oh, my gosh, poor children. Take a trip to Southeast. Those kids see the same thing. Um, Maybe not as much of it, um, but they see it, and they see it regularly, and to think that it doesn't have as much of an impact on them and how they learn and how they feel and how they grow up, Um, we would be fooling ourselves. The last thing is is that we need to stop trying to put all schools in one big bucket, trying to grade them the same way um, and trying to hold them accountable the same way. Just like um, people are different and individual, um, schools are different and they're individual. There are different climates, there are different situations that take place in the school, there are different physical plants and environments. Um, So we need to stop trying to make a cookie cutter model Um, for how we're going to grow and evaluate schools. So those would be my top three. Quickly. There's a lot in the national national curriculum um, for all students to have the same national uh, training, education. What's your perspective on that? I I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't oppose it. I don't support it. I'm ambivalent on it. I mean, I think, like I said in the end, I mean, I think if it's important to you that you be able to compare children and if it's important to you that you be able to compare, you know, pass rates from state to state, if it's important that you think that you want children to, um, you know, at some level be learning some of the same basket of things, although to some degree I think children across the country are learning similar baskets of things. I mean, just, just because you know, we don't have a national curriculum now doesn't mean we don't. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's the answer to more than that, to more than saying we have um, a common measure. Um. Um, I think I'll take two more questions. Um, Kevin? Hi, uh, uh, Kevin Carey from the education sector. Um, question, Linda, you talked about, <coughs> you mentioned a couple times the, the, the young girl um, with wild well, retardation who was at the first grade level but being taught fourth grade material and that was the example you used in the uh, op-ed you wrote in the Washington Post um, mm-hmm. a few weeks ago and, and, and there you, you kind of talked about how that was an example of, of why uh, No Child Left Behind should be approved or we considered. Um, but it's, it strikes me as that, that as a response to No Child Left Behind that kind of approach is doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, I mean it, it's futile. I mean it's not even a good way to game the system if that's what you're trying to do. Uh, if you teach a child like that mm-hmm. at the fourth grade level all year, uh, they don't pass the test. They're not really any, you're not any better off than you would have been. I agree. So, so why, why do you think, so I guess two questions. Is that actually an example of why No Child Left Behind needs to change and why do you think the teachers did that? I, I use it as an example of why, um, as an example of why you can't why you can't assume that a growth model will give you the information you think it's going to give you, okay? It's not necessarily going to give you very specific improvement on, indivi- on individual improvement for each child like that child. So that's what I was trying to use it as an example for, okay? So if you really had a, you know, if you had a, really had a system where each child was sort of judged at the level they started and then, at the, you know, a year later they're judged, you know, how far have you moved, then, then you really kind of start to see have they made progress, okay? Um, So that's what I was trying to use that as an example for. Is it a good way to, to, I mean, I think that they knew she was going to be basic, right? Um, Yet they still did things this way. I I don't defend that, certainly. I mean, I don't think that was what, and I don't, and I don't know exactly, you know, I just, and it wasn't about necessarily no child left behind in that case. I think, I think in a sense, I mean, I think it's, globally about No Child Left Behind, but that's the fourth grade open court curriculum. You know, that's the fourth grade pacing guides. And, um, you know, most special education teachers in this country will tell you, and ESOL, you know, if if, if the issue at hand is ESOL, will tell you. Explain what ESOL is. Oh, I'm sorry, English as a second language. They'll tell you that, um, you know, 
the pressures they are under, whether it comes eventually from the, you know, how people react to the law or whether it's because the people in their building or the people in their school system, the pressures they are under are to teach those kids, um, move them along with everyone else, the understanding that if they have the proper accommodations, um, you know, that, that they can do it. For some, for some kids, you know, the proper accommodations are, are fine and, and, and enough to get them to where they can be tested on a fourth grade level. Um, I, just, I just wanted to use that example to tell people the growth model isn't going to solve all of your problems. And these are the kinds of decisions people are making now. Um, they'll tell you they're making it because of No Child Left Behind. I don't let them off the hook that easy because the law doesn't tell you to teach her, you know, metaphor necessarily. So um, I would like educators, and I'm not just saying that teacher because really it wasn't her choice, but all the way down the line to be making smarter decisions regardless of, of um, how they feel um, what, the, what they feel the law is telling them to do. And, you know, I, I, I would venture to tell you that most educators really don't even understand what the law says. I don't think they really even know what the law says and doesn't say, um, which is pretty evident when um, you hear them blame the law for things. And, and I understand that the law has created a certain climate or enhanced a certain climate where these decisions are being made. But a lot of times they should be really blaming no one more than their principal's boss or, you know, someone in the school system or their principal or something. One final question, um, ma'am. Um, I was just wondering, because you folks were talking about the culture of fear that has been cultivated by MCLB in the administration and the teachers. I was just wondering if you felt in your research and your time working as a principal, that culture of fear has been cultivated in the children as well. Oh, I mean, wow. are they, do they validate themselves on how well they do on these tests? I mean, how, how does it affect them on a day? Well, they don't necessarily, a lot of them don't really even find, I mean, they're eight. Like, they, they I think in the school I was at and in, and, and for this book, you know, that they were freaked out by the test because of the big deal everyone else was. I mean, they did meditation every week in the library before their practice tests, and they had to do these um, bizarre calisthenics, and all they heard about was, I mean, like you touch the tongue to your roof of your mouth, and you rub your belly at the same time, and that will activate the occipital portion of your brain while sucking a peppermint, and you know, um, peppermint. When, when that kind of approach is taken, you can't help but sort of think when you're even when, even at the age of eight, and there's like people are, you know, the, the first graders are making you signs about MSA and this is all you hear and you hear about your test taking skills every day. I mean, you can't help but be a little free. They even brought out in a giant Muppet for a pep rally mm -hmm. about MSA. You can't help but sort of be a little freaked out by it. Um, but that's, but that was, that was that building, you know. Um, I don't think, I think that, I think that, um, it's not, you know, it's not a requirement to pass on the next grade in Maryland, at least. Um, I think that in Virginia, where the standards are learning, you know, I mean, I think that where they're required for graduation or very specifically to pass on to the next grade, there is, you know, there's, there is a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not one of those people who says, like, our children are so precious, they can't, you know, we, we can't make them do anything that's stressful for them. But at the same time, you know, they really would have benefited from, like, having an assembly at once before the test that had nothing to do with the test or, you know, I think that, um, I think that they pick up on the intensity where the school allows them to feel that pressure or where it's a very specific requirement to move ahead. And we did do assessment yoga. Um, we cut out the yojo <laughs> assemblies with the big blue bird. Um, because, and it's the pep bird. rallies, because it, <laughs> after like the second year, because it really did up. You brought Yojo to the, your school too? Uh, yeah, Yojo, yeah. he's everywhere, right? Um, <laughs> he's the big assessment bird who does the assemblies. But um, he's funny. Just <laughs> to tell you about 
Um, the children and being afraid. This last time we took um, the DC cast, there was a student who ran out of class. We got the call in the office. I went into the boys' bathroom because that's where he was hiding. He was shut up in one of the stalls. And I said, you know, come on, honey, you got to come out. We got to take this test. He said, Miss Wright, I can't come out. I said, why can't you come out? He says, because I won't be green, Miss Wright. I won't be green. I didn't study hard enough. I won't be green. And green means that you're proficient. And we had always posted the test data. So he was just stress needs to say he didn't test that day because he wasn't in the right frame of mind and so he sat in the office with me because we had makeup days so I let him sit it out because he just wasn't ready but he was a really good example of how the stress was just too much for him to bear um, on that day around the assessment piece so and even though it's not a requirement to pass on to the next grade um, Parents don't necessarily tell their children that. Sometimes you have teachers with bad practices who you'll hear them saying, if you want to go to the next grade, you know you got to do good on this test. And so a lot of kids do internalize that in order for me to be successful, um, I need to be green. Um, I have to be a green line and not red and not yellow, um, green or blue. So it's, it's not good always what it does to the children. And they were just excited. Like they knew after MSA they might get to do science mm -hmm. and they might get to go on a field trip. <laughs> a and party. So, I mean, it was, there were some kids with definite fear, but so, in a lot of cases it was just like they saw it as a barrier to actually doing stuff that Matter. would engage them. <laughs> what did that kid do? Um, he was better. He spent the morning with me. He was better. We talked about, you know, the fact that he, he was able to read. He's down there doing reading drills, seeing how fast he can read Cat in the Hat because the passages are long. So beefing up his stamina because it was important to him. And he was green. Um, all he of it. He did. He did. He was proficient. So. Yeah, he was proficient. Well, and on that note, I want to thank everyone for coming and thank Linda and Tracy for taking the time to be here.